All right. So today's topic is Come and Dine, Luke 14, verses 1 to 24. Now, Jesus is going to use the metaphor of an invitation to a banquet or a feast as an invitation to the kingdom of God. All right. So the invitation to the banquet, to a feast, to a wedding feast, I see somebody familiar up there, right? Uh, is the kingdom, is, is an invitation to the kingdom of God. And Jesus is going to use various parables in this passage to tell us, to invite us rather, to come and dine with him. And yet many people will reject that invitation, right? And many people will reject the gospel of Jesus Christ as well. In verse 1, Jesus was at the home of a Pharisee to eat bread on the Sabbath day. Now, this is kind of like a repeat, a similar pattern that we see in the Gospel of Luke. Over and over again, we see that um, Jesus is going to be in the presence of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's going to do some healing on the Sabbath day. And they're going to watch him and to catch him for breaking their Pharisees' rules, which they have added to the Word of God. And so verse 1, And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that he watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. Now, dropsy is a kind of uh, swelling. We don't know which part of the body had the swelling. Probably somewhere that is quite uh, um, obvious. Maybe on the face or maybe on the hands. There's a big swelling and maybe it's full of fluid and it may be weepy as well, and it may be very, very painful. And Jesus saw that, and Jesus said uh, unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? And they held their peace. Now, obviously, the answer is no, right? Because, but they know that this is a long-standing uh, discussion or debate with, with uh, Jesus. It has happened so many times. And they held their peace, and he took him and healed him and let him go. And answered them, saying, Which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. Now, we have talked about this previously, about uh, exceptions to the Sabbath law, right? Yes, we are to honour the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days we are to work, and on seventh day we should not work. This speaks of our regular work, right? But it doesn't mean that we cannot heal somebody on the Sabbath. And that is why we say there are exceptions like uh, acts of mercy and acts of necessity. These are exceptions to the Sabbath rule. And that is why hospitals continue to function, because people will die if you do not take care of them right, on the Sabbath day. Right? So they are in the incubator, and then there's nobody, no nurse around, no doctors want to work on Sundays. Right? People will die in the hospitals. Right? So there are exceptions to this law. And that is what Jesus is saying here. And of course, there's also acts of necessity. Right? You need to eat, you need to take public transport to get to uh, the sanctuary to, to come here. Right? You need to take the MRT. So some people have to work on the Sabbath so that these uh, necessities right, uh, can continue. Uh, normal life can continue uh, and it can serve all of us. So it also means that Christians sometimes may be scheduled to work on Sundays, right? And so sometimes we have to accept that if it falls within the work of necessity and works of mercy. But if your work requires to work every Sunday, and that means that you will have to skip every Lord's Day worship, then maybe you should look for another job because you do not want to miss the Lord's Day worship. All right? So try to talk to your employer to allow you to come to church on Sunday. Right, verses 7 to 11. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden, when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honourable man than thou be bidden of him. Right, so Jesus was very observant about all these things happening in the wedding feast, usually. Uh, the, it also happens in some of our modern-day wedding feasts that you get gate crashes, right? Gate crashes. People who are not invited, people who are not invited to the 
to the uh, wedding and they turn up, right? And then they try to see, okay, where is there an empty seat? And they try to come in, right? But here, Jesus is talking about the phenomenon of the Jews always trying to elevate themselves, right? And so when they go to the wedding feast, they always try to sit in the uppermost seats. Their seats that are considered VIP tables, right? VIP seats, right? Maybe right in front so that everyone can see. So the most important VVIPs usually sit in front so that the rest of the people can see, oh, who is who is here, right? And usually for a, um, let's say you are uh, inviting uh, people for the wedding feast of your children, for example, you will also try to invite people who are honourable in society, people who is who is who in society, to try to invite them to your feast and they will elevate your status, right? So that others will see, wow, you are able to invite the Prime Minister of Singapore to your son's wedding feast. Or you are able to invite uh, so-and-so, the richest man in Singapore, to your wedding feast. And everyone will start talking and, you know, it kind of elevates their status. But here, the Jews, the problem is that many of them try to elevate their own status by sitting at the VIP table, right? Obviously, these people don't belong to the VIP table. And they will be ashamed because they will be told that you have to go down, right? Verse 9, And he that bade thee him come and will come and say, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, and that when he that bade thee come, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher, then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Right? So this is just um, uh, learning humility, learning humility. Huh? Uh, and um, Jesus teaching us about the etiquette of uh, offering hospitality and also receiving hospitality. So we who are on the receiving end of hospitality, we should learn to uh, be humble. So we are invited to a feast. Don't assume that you will naturally sit at the VIP position. Okay? Uh, always go and sit at the lowest position. But of course, nowadays, you will have, when you go to a wedding, you will have a pointed seat, right? A pointed table, right? Pointed table, right? And they will tell you, okay, which table you belong to. Right? So you will not uh, get mixed up. So I, I don't know why it wasn't the case uh, in those days, but um, um, this was the convention. So Jesus was teaching us to be humble. Right? It applies to other social contexts as well. Right? Uh, when you go to uh, a feast, right? people invite you to a feast. Uh, don't be the first to rush to the buffet table. Right? <laughs> And usually they always say, okay, let the elderly and those with children uh, go first, right? Uh, so, so, I mean, this is also part of etiquette and courtesy. And loving your neighbour as yourself, okay? Invite the poor, blind and disabled to your party because they cannot repay you, right? And this is another principle that Jesus is giving us. So let's read verses 12 to 15. Then said he also to him, Cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of heaven. Right, so here Jesus is taking that principle one step further. Right? Jesus is saying that when you have a feast, don't just invite those who are honourable in society, the VIPs, right? because they can recompense thee. And they will invite you back for another lunch or dinner. Whereas, 
if we have opportunities to love our neighbour as ourselves. Remember Jesus always talks about uh, the fact that if you have given water to quench the thirsty, if you have given bread to feed the hungry, if you have given clothes to clothe the naked, if you have, given, if you have visited the sick and visited someone in prison, you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So that's the idea here, right? Uh, be, be kind and loving to people who cannot recompense thee. And so, who do we invite? Call the poor, the maimed, the lame. There's no way they can repay you. But you can show the love of God to them. The lame, the blind, and the disabled. Right? And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee. For thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Your, your rewards will be in heaven. Your rewards will be given by Christ for all the kind things, the loving things that you do for the brethren and also for non-believers. Right? So whatever you do, your reward is in heaven. So Jesus' teaching really goes against the grain of the thinking of the people in the world. The people in the world, when you go, let's say you go to a conference, you go to a networking event, People always want to zoom in on the who is who, right? Who are the, 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 the well-known businessmen, the well-known people in the field, to try to get to know them, to exchange uh, contacts, you know, and to try to get business contracts. So you zoom in on whoever is going to uh, benefit you, right, financially. And Jesus is saying, no, right, as Christians, we should be always looking out for those who cannot help us, but we can be a help to them. Not, it's not to say that you cannot go to a business event and network with people, but at the same time, also look out for people who are trying to talk to you. Uh, people who cannot help you, but who, who need your help. Right? So they may be coming to you thinking that you can be a blessing to them, uh, but you, you, you shove them aside because... I've got more important people to talk to, right? So that's the idea here, so in terms of an application of how can we apply this principle that we ought always to look at those who cannot recompense us, who cannot do good to, not that they cannot do good, but they cannot repay our kindness, right, in, in many ways, uh, but you can be a blessing to them. And then he went on to give the parable of the great, Supper. Verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many to come. He had a great feast, uh, a big lunch, invited many, many people to attend. Uh, people of high status. And um, what's the response of those people who were invited? And he sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuses, right? So many of them tell them they could not attend. The first excuse, the first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. So in other words, I have bought a piece of land or maybe a farmland or vineyard, whatever it is, and I need to go and inspect it. I need to survey it. Question, wouldn't you have done that before you purchased the land? Surely you would have done that, right? You would have surveyed it before you know how much to pay for the land. Surely you would have seen what kind of soil is it? Is it fertile soil? Uh, the, the shape of the land? Uh, and, and, and you know what is the price? What's the market price uh, for that piece of land? So all the surveys you know, and inspection of the quality of the soil and um, the weather and all that, you know, and, and, and the elevation and uh, whether it's sloping or flat land or mountainous land, all these things you would have done before you purchased the land because all these have an impact on the value or on the price of the property. So what this really tells us is that this person is just giving an excuse, right? Just giving an excuse. Uh, uh, or in a sim Maybe in a Singapore context, it would be like, I've just got my HDB flat. Uh, I'm doing renovation now. I'm very busy doing renovation, so I don't have time to come to 
to to your church to to worship, right? I have to do a lot of things. I I have to buy furniture. I have to, yeah. I, I would love to attend your feast, but I don't have time. Okay, so that would be like a typical kind of uh, excuse. Excuse number two, business. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excuse. Right, so this guy has just bought five yoke of oxen. He needs to prove them. Right? To prove them means to examine, to test the genuineness of them. Right? So surely it's the same thing, right? You would have tested all these animals before you know how much to pay for them. Isn't it? I mean, you would not pay for a sick animal, an, animal that, an ox that is not strong and not able to plough the land. So you would have inspected the health of the oxen before you pay the price for it. So again, this is an excuse, right? I'm just too busy working overtime. I'm exhausted after I bought these five yoke of oxen. And I'm uh, surely you understand that as a Christian, work is important, right? I need to do, I need to do overtime to get certain things done, right? Um, and thirdly, family. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come, right? So family is often used also as an excuse or as a reason why they cannot come to a feast or they cannot come to God. They cannot come to church for worship, right? Um, this guy is very, very busy because after marriage, uh, he says your invitation has come at the most inconvenient time. Right? I need to spend time with my wife. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, and thanks for attending my wedding feast, <laughs> but I don't have time for uh, your feast. Okay, so this third man may be too busy with his wife, too busy with his children, too busy with his parents, uh, caring for aging parents and so on. Now, that it, all these are legitimate. Right? We are all called as God's children to have responsibility to take care of our aging parents, to take care of our uh, wives and our children. Certainly, we all have responsibilities, but there is a time for everything, and there is a priority as well. And here Jesus is talking, as I mentioned earlier on, the metaphor of a feast, invitation to a feast, is really about inviting the people to the kingdom of God. Right? But people are rejecting Christ, they're rejecting God, they're rejecting salvation, because they say, I am too busy. Or they may say, that I have been saved, since I'm saved, I know I'm going to heaven, I don't need to come to church. And there are many Christians all like that. Right? After they have saved, right? oh, oh I've, uh, I've not been coming to church for a long time. Yeah, I don't see the need of coming to church. So Jesus is asking, where are your priorities in life? Where is your priority? Where does God rank in your priority? Is God anywhere in your list of priorities? Or are you always so busy that you have no time for God? I don't have time. Don't bother me. Many years ago, um, when I was conducting a course on exploring Christianity, I spoke to a young doctor uh, in Singapore. And he said, I believe the Bible. I believe that Jesus is the Savior. Um, but you know, I'm in the middle of a very busy period of my life. I'm married with two young kids. I'm a very busy doctor in a government hospital. I'm still taking some specialist exams. I really don't have time to attend church on Sunday mornings. These are his exact words, basically. Right? And this is a very common reason why people do not, have, do, not, do not want to come to church because I'm too busy. So my reply to him is, if today is your last day in your life and you're going to meet with your saviour, would you still say the same thing? Because that puts things in perspective, isn't it? Because you, you know what is our life? Our life is just what we do every day, week after week, month after month, year after year. If every month I'm saying I'm very busy, I have no time for God. I'm too busy, I have no time for God. Next year, I'm too busy, I have no time for God. And this will repeat throughout your life. And your entire life, you have no time for God. And you expect God to have time for you? Right? Why, why would God have time for it? Why would God acknowledge that you are His child? Right? When we die, 
why would God acknowledge that we are Christian, that I am a Christian? If throughout my life I do not have time for God. If we understand the concept of who God is, right? Fear of God is the understanding of the awareness of who God is. Who is God? Our Creator. He made us for Himself. He didn't make us for ourselves. He didn't make us to pursue our selfish ambitions. He made us for Himself so that we will glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. We will serve Him all the days of our life. We will love Him with all our heart, strength and mind and love our neighbour as ourselves. That is the purpose that God made us to glorify Him, to love Him, to serve Him. Right? So, for us to say that I don't have time for God is a sin, right? We must set our priorities right. If you are too busy to make time for God, you are far too busy than you should be, all right? So you need to reorder your priorities. And the question also is, have you wondered who gave you your land? Have you wondered who gave you your business, your oxen? And who gave you your wife and your children? You know, very often Christians, they will come to church, they're baptized, you know. And then when they start getting married and have children, they get so busy. And they say that, oh, I don't have time to come to church. But did you not pray to God and ask God for a good job? All right. And now you're saying that, oh, it is this job that's taking me away from you. I don't have time for you because I have this good job that demands so much of my time. And likewise, now you're saying that I have a wife that I prayed for and God gave me a godly wife and God gave me children that I prayed for and you are using the same reasons to tell God that I don't have time for you because I'm too busy with my wife and my children. Who gave you these blessings? So have we inadvertently turned our blessings into a curse? In other words, we are now blaming God no? for giving me all these blessings. God, it's all your fault. You gave me this job, I got to work overtime. God, you gave me this wife, I need to spend a lot of time with her to make her happy. Right? God, you gave me these children, I need to take care of them. It's all your fault that I have all these wife and children and job that I don't have time for you. Isn't that what we are telling God? Isn't that so? So we have, to be, we have to check ourselves, right? Do we have time? Do we have our right priorities? Who gave you all these blessings? And, and yet these are the excuses that people are giving for not coming to Christ and for not serving God. It just shows how ungrateful we are. Isn't that true? That God has given us the blessings that we pray for and yet we are turning those blessings into excuses for not wanting to come to God and not wanting to serve God and not wanting to worship God. The three common excuses we have seen, property, business, family, right? And so Jesus is telling us all are invited to the kingdom of God, but there are very few who will accept it because most people in the world are too caught up with the things of the world, with their own activities, their busy activities uh, around the world, that they don't have time for God. Sorry, I have no time is a lie because we always have time for what is important to us. Isn't that true? We always have time for something that is important to us. So the question is, why is God not important to some of us. Why? Why is God not important to some of us that He is not on our priority list? Number one. All right, if we know who God is, God must be number one in our lives. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Meaning, no one else can take the place of God in our hearts. God must be number one. If God is number one, we cannot put our work number one. We cannot put our family number one. We cannot put our properties number one. Right? So, this is really something that reminds us that we always have time for social media, TikTok, Facebook, right? Korean drama, right? K-pop, whatever, right? If we have time for these things, 
is God less important than all these? Right? Reading the Bible, praying on Wednesday night, come, come together to pray. Right? It is important that we set aside the time. And Jesus says, let's read these verses. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city, and bring hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Yeah, so Jesus says, go to the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind, the disabled, these people who cannot recompense you. And they will be so happy to get free food. And they cannot repay you. Go to them, right? And that is why you see Jesus when in his earthly ministry. He did not spend a lot of time with the rich people. He spent a lot of time with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the down and out, the so-called the lowest social status in society, the poor, even the children, they are of the kingdom of God, right? Just earlier on, we were talking to our brother and then he says, he was telling me that a lot of the rich people don't need God because they are all self-made men and women. They don't need God and they will not turn to God. And that's what Jesus said. It is easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than for him to enter the kingdom of God. Right? For a camel, rather. For a camel to go through the eye of the needle. <laughs> for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Then for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Sorry, I've distorted it. <laughs> okay. You have a nightmare of a camel going through the eye of a needle. Yeah. Okay, so, so we are to reach out to those who cannot recompense us. You see, very often when we evangelize, we think, oh, I think I should try to reach this person because this person is a very nice person and very intellectual and very smart person. So I should try to reach this person, right? Rather than go to those who, are, who we think would not, uh, would not accept the gospel. But very often we are proven wrong, right? Isn't that the case? When we try to talk to these intellectual people and those who are well-to-do people, they don't need God. They don't need God and they don't even see the, the, the purpose or they don't believe, they reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. But when we go to those who are poor, who are considered uh, not as well off, perhaps they are more ready to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Go into the hedges and highway and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Right, so here we have the Moses Han, a Cambodian missionary, uh, who took the street kids. Right? He's a Korean, he studied at the Bible College, and he went to Cambodia, and he took those poor street kids in Cambodia, who were just running around in gangs, getting into trouble, stealing things and all that, because their parents are too poor to send them to schools. Right? So they couldn't go to schools, and so they just run around every day in the streets. And Moses Han took these kids, cut their hair, give them an education, give them Christian education, schools, to study the Bible, to learn English, to learn the Cambodian language, Khmer language, and give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some of them came to know the Lord. Some of them gave themselves to be pastors, to be full-time missionaries. And I believe this is what Jesus is talking about. Right? We ought to be looking out for those who are poor and down and out and reach out to them and bring them into the kingdom because they cannot recompense you, but they are the ones who will appreciate the kingdom of heaven. And the key lessons we have learned, firstly, is that God has furnished a complete salvation. Right? This is not a potluck. You don't need to bring anything to the feast. 
the complete feast is already provided by God. Just come as you are, enjoy the feast and the food. It is a great salvation sufficient for all sinners. And God invites in the gospel and he gives us ample notice before we die. Gives us ample notice. He gives us plenty of opportunities to repent of our sins, to turn to Christ for salvation. Some of us may have rejected Christ when we were in our childhood or in our teens, but we have turned to Christ in our adulthood or when we are retired or even on the deathbed. And even the unworthy are invited because Christ has come for the unworthy, the poor, the blind, the lame, the maimed. No one is disqualified. All that you need is to believe that I'm a sinner, I need Christ, Christ is my saviour, He's died for me on the cross. I trust in Him. His precious blood can cleanse me from all my sins. I'm white as snow, washed white as snow, and therefore, I just need to repent of my sins and receive Christ as my Saviour and Lord. The only condition is humility. And Jesus is our Saviour. Right? He feeds us with the living bread. He satisfies our spiritual hunger and thirst. He's the only one in the whole world who can satisfy us completely. He gives us the water and the life. He brings us around the table. He hosts the Lord's Supper. And later on, we will enjoy and partake of the Lord's Supper. He is the bread and He is the cup. He is, his body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us so that we may partake of the eternal life that He offers to all of us. And Jesus said unto them, let's read these verses together. I, and Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you, that ye also have seen me and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. If you were to come to Jesus, Jesus is compassionate. He will not cast you out. I know some of us uh, who are of the hyper-Calvinist uh, persuasion think that, oh, what if I'm not the elect? There's some people who say, I'm, what if I'm not the elect? Maybe I'm not the elect. Therefore, I cannot come to Jesus. Well, Jesus says that it is up to you to come to Jesus. You have heard the gospel. You've understood the gospel. If you come to Jesus, and you believe with all your heart that Jesus is your Saviour, and you are born again, the Holy Spirit is given to you, you are regenerated, you have eternal life from the moment of conversion, you are the elect. Right? So the responsibility is on us to come to Jesus. Right? And so don't blame God for the doctrine of election or predestination. It is our responsibility to come to Jesus. The Pharisees give excuses for rejecting Christ and they even send him to die on the cross. And today Christ is calling all sinners to come and dine. Come into the kingdom of God. And we thank God that Mr. Tang, uh, the father of Brother Desmond, at 80 plus years old, received Christ uh, a couple of months ago after many decades of prayer by Desmond. All right. And so we rejoiced also in, when I was in Malaysia, in KL, one of the deaconess brother who has stage 4 cancer in the hospital, uh, she was telling me that uh, she, she, she tries to reach the, the brother, but the, the brother was hardened in his heart, and she keeps re, he keeps rejecting Christ over and over and over again. But one fine day, she says, never mind, I will still try, and I'll ask the pastor and the elder to come and visit him. And lo and behold, on that evening, when the pastor and the elder came to share the gospel with him, he was ready to receive the gospel. And he says, yes, yes, I want to believe. I want to receive Jesus as my Savior and Lord. The deaconess couldn't believe her, her, her eyes and her ears. You know, it's like, she has been praying for decades and he keeps saying, no, 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 no. Even while he was sick in the hospital, he keeps saying no. But when the pastor and the elder came, the time was right. Salvation is of the Lord. 
Amen? Amen. Yeah, so don't give up. Don't give up. I know some of us have been praying for our loved ones, our children or parents or grandchildren or siblings. Don't give up, your aunties and uncles. Don't give up praying for them. Don't give up reaching out to them. You never know when is the right time when God will save them. And one day Jesus is going to invite us to that great marriage supper of the Lamb. Right, let's read these verses. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. The marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife has made herself ready. This is the feast that Jesus calls all his beloved children to. And the wife of the Lamb is the bride of Christ, which is the church. And that means all of us are invited to the feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we will all be given fine linen robes, which is the righteousness of the saints given by our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for your word that is truth. We pray that we may be ready to enter into the feast of the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, we want to pray for some who are still undecided in a dilemma, uh, not sure about taking that step of faith. Lord, we pray that today may be the day of salvation. We pray that today you will speak to such a heart that he or she will come to believe in Jesus as his or her saviour and master and follow Christ all the days of his or her life. And for the rest of us who are believers, help us, Lord, to put you first in our lives, that we will always strive to have you as our priority, that we will serve you fervently, joyously and zealously all the days of our life, to love you with all our heart, strength and might, and to love our neighbour as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.